even one grain of yeast leaven such a large amount of flour? How can something so small and insignificant make an impact on this world? Why is an unwanted weed compared to God's kingdom? How can something that is out of place be good? There's something about God's kingdom that surprises those who are used to the realities of this world, where power and winning looks a certain way. God's work is often accomplished, on the other hand, for the weak and the ones that this world calls losers. As we enter into this time of worship, may the presence of God be with us in surprising ways that remind us of how God often moves beyond our expectations. Join me in prayer. God, open our eyes to see your kingdom coming in small and seemingly insignificant ways. Your kingdom grows in surprising ways through unexpected people and in unexpected places. May we not miss the work of your hands, even as we worship. Amen. so good to be with you again this morning. Today I want to talk with you about two things you may not be real familiar with. The first is a mustard seed. See how tiny the mustard seeds are? They are the smallest seeds I have ever seen. And look at the yeast. The yeast comes in very small packets. Both are very small, yet in our Bible lesson today, the mustard seed 
and yeast are used by Jesus to describe what the kingdom of heaven is like. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all your seeds, when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. What can we learn from the mustard seed? Well, I think we can learn that we are never too small to be important in God's eyes. You and I baby, may be small, but we can help to grow the kingdom of God. Some of you may not be familiar with yeast. Do you know what happens when you take a tiny amount of yeast and mix it with water and flour, salt and a little bit of sugar? The yeast spreads all through the mixture and produces dough that gives you big, soft, fluffy, delicious loaves of bread. The flour and water and sugar and salt just can't do it alone. The yeast has an effect on everything, just from one tiny piece. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until it was all of it was leavened. That is what Jesus wants us to do. He wants us as part of his kingdom to change the world around us and make it better. The ministry of Jesus started very small, 12 men in an obscure corner of Galilee, but it has spread throughout the world. Like a small amount of yeast affects the entire loaf, the disciples of Jesus have affected the entire world. The nature of yeast is to grow and to change whatever it contacts. When we accept Christ, his grace grows in our hearts and changes us from the inside out. And as the gospel changes lives, it changes the entire world. You may be small, but like the mustard seed and the yeast, you are important in the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray. Dear God, help us to remember that size is not important in your kingdom. You can use even the smallest one of us to grow the kingdom and bring change to the world around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be with you this morning. Our scripture reading this morning is the 13th chapter of Matthew, verses 31 through 35. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and they make their nests in its branches. And he told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. Jesus told the crowds all of these things in parables. Without a parable, he told them nothing. This was to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophets. I will open my mouth to speak in parables. I will proclaim what has been hidden from the foundation of the world. People are obsessed with growth. We love following the milestones of human growth through childhood and, and tracking height by, by markings on the wall. We love seeing our accounts grow and accumulating that financial buffer. We love building additions on our homes and our churches. We love seeing our businesses grow and increase impact and revenue. And, and of course, those of us in the church love seeing or imagining our church attendance growing. A hard thing to measure anyhow, but especially in these days. Growth is good. So in today's scripture, we read two parables of Jesus talking about the growth of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is growing. 
One of my earliest questions that I brought to the text this week was, was how do we see the kingdom growing? How do we see it expanding? What's, what's the evidence of such expansive growth around us? So many times I hear that in our world there is, there is no evidence of Christian expansion, and that, and that comes from both evangelicals and progressives. Evangelicals decry Christian influence over prayer in public schools, or posting the Ten Commandments publicly, or a younger generation less inter- interested in attending worship. Progressives mourn the church not taking a stronger, more assertive lead in the struggles for equity and justice. So where's the kingdom taking root? Where's the evidence of such growth when the church around us seems to be on the decline? Contemporary author and theologian Peter Rollins reflected on a bumper sticker he saw once that said, If Christianity were illegal would there be enough evidence to convict you? And the, the question struck him in such a way that he wrote his own parable, and, and I'll summarize it like this. In a community where being a Christ follower is very much illegal, a man is put on trial for the practice of Christianity, and the, the prosecution brings evidence like worship CDs, and Christian literature, and even the well-worn Bible with notes made in the margins. Witnesses recall times where the man even led in worship and he spoke at special religious meetings. Certainly there was ample evidence for conviction until the judge delivered a not guilty verdict, saying that that all this is evidence that you're a good speaker and an actor, nothing more. We don't have interest in armchair artists, he said. To be sure, Rollins creates this probing parable fishing for the evidence of discipleship in the kingdom of God, where possession of Christian books, Christian jewelry, Christian t-shirts, Christian attendance, all might just fall short of the evidence of an expanding, growing kingdom of God. So maybe the kingdom of God is growing all around us, but in ways that aren't necessarily catching our attention. The two parables of Jesus this morning compare the kingdom of God and its growth to that of a mustard seed and a little bit of yeast in a big batch of flour. But let's take these one at a time. So first, let's start with the mustard seed. Simply, the mustard seed is small and it grows to be big, much like the gospel starts with Jesus and grows around the world, or the kingdom of God is inaugurated in Jesus and it spreads across the world. Such an interpretation of the parable would be accurate, but missing some very special nuance. As commentators often remark, there are smaller seeds in Palestine that yield bigger trees, bigger shrubs. If the parable were about strength and size of the tree, why not use the cedar of Lebanon as the image, a tree referenced repeatedly in Scripture and used in the construction of of Solomon's temple? That's an image of grand growth from something so small. Jesus' audience might hear of a man planting a a mustard shrub in his field and think, why? That's like a grand weed that grows everywhere and hardly desirable in your field. In the particulars, we discover that the kingdom of God might grow and spread like a weed, deemed out of place or undesirable by the masses. So now consider the parable of the yeast. While it's certain commonplace in in our kitchens in those little packets for the making of bread and other tasty treats, you might consider how Jesus' audience heard a reference to yeast. First, as a metaphor, yeast is often a bad thing. The Apostle Paul talks about boasting being like yeast that that gets into a person or a community and it leavens it with, with malice, not with goodness. 
Yeast was an undesirable thing in the Jewish household on those special religious holidays. William Barclays reminds us that yeast is to be purged from the household and burned before Passover. So for Jesus to use such an undesirable image in his parable might, well, it might shock his audience. Oh no, we don't want the whole batch leavened. <laughs> Again, in the particulars, we discover that the kingdom might grow and expand like a pervasive and questionable substance. During our Tuesday evening worship chat on this scripture, one participant said that all this sounded like, like gossip, which could be an interesting contemporary analogy. The kingdom of God spreads like gossip in many ways undesirable, and yet it takes off. It can't be stopped. The kingdom of God's growth is inevitable. Jesus is going about it, but to many of us, Jesus' reign is a threat to my reign. This is what makes the kingdom of God as undesirable as a weed or gossip. It's not that the kingdom of heaven is a bad reign, but that it's a threatening one. It threatens the, the flowers that I've planted, the, the home that I've attempted to purify, the, the self-image that I've attempted to project. When the kingdom of heaven infiltrates me and my life, I'm, I'm revealed. The plants in my garden have, have selfish intent. The, the purity of my home isn't actually factual. And my self-projection is flawed, an illusion. The kingdom of heaven, being a place of truth, is filled with people known completely by the new and righteous king as broken, confused, and flawed. And, and we all get to be transformed like the leavening bread. As followers of Jesus, may we not be intimidated by the transforming nature of the kingdom of heaven. May we not be intimidated by the values of the reign of God. But may we step courageously into them. I began this message telling you that these are parables about growth. And they are. But underneath a simple message of the growing kingdom, we learn through Jesus' choice of images that the growth is unexpected, threatening, intimidating. We all want growth. But I question if our typical desires for growth hit the mark. Fuller pews, more money, more influence, more Jesus t-shirts. Certainly, some of these markers of growth will accompany the expansion of the reign of God, but they are not the evidence of God's reign. So if we're looking for the evidence of the kingdom growing among us even now, maybe we ought not look for Jesus' paraphernalia, but rather look for evidence of people and congregations and communities yielding their aspirations for growth to the growth that Jesus seeks. Transforming lives of sinners, extravagant forgiveness, communities seeking true peace combined with justice and mercy, and genuine expressions of self-giving love. For these, these are the marks of the kingdom of heaven expanding in our midst. When yeast works into a loaf, we see its effect. But we don't see the yeast. So people of Jesus, show the effects of the kingdom spreading in your lives so that even now, before such kingdom is fully manifest, people might see evidence that the kingdom is on the way. And while threatening to a current way of life, it is certainly worthwhile to pour yourself into the batch of dough. Because the kingdom of love is growing. And it is on the way. Amen.
The kingdom grows and expands in surprising ways because when we work together and pool our resources, we are able to do so much more than we could ever do alone. The church is a foretaste of God's coming kingdom. And so we begin to live into this new reality, this surprising reality, where God's goodness, love, and grace grow exponentially larger and faster than we would ever expect because we don't do it alone. We do it together. As you give of yourself and your gifts, may God grow our impact and scope even more than we could ever imagine for God's glory. Join me in the pastoral prayer ending with the Lord's Prayer. Gracious God, it is tempting to only look for you in the order and beauty we see in this world. But what about your presence in the chaos and seemingly out-of-place things? What about in those surprising places where something deemed unclean is given a place of honor? Our attempts to box you into our world order are constantly thwarted. Our desire to limit you to our terms simply limits our ability to experience the height, depth, and breadth of your goodness. Your power, your will, your grace is bigger than our own. And so when we pray, we are reminded that we are speaking words that invite you to do what you will with our lives, with our desires, with our needs. As we join together in prayer this morning, we uphold one another and pray together with unified voices the words that your Son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
The kingdom of God is growing all around us like, like mustard seeds and, and yeast leavening a batch of dough. But because they grow in this way, it might be unexpected. It might be time to, to cast aside some of our assumptions for the way the kingdom grows and pay attention for a new way, a different way, a threatening way. That the kingdom grows now, all around. Amen.